Keep talking. What game are we playing? Keep talking. <laughs> Dear Father, 
I ask you to give me strength to live this day as you would have me live it. Guide me in shining with the light of Jesus Christ in my words and actions. Fill me with your spirit so that I may be for others an instrument of hope, peace, and love. Use me to bring joy to others so that they may understand the life you desire for all your children. Amen. Please stand. Okay, have any of you ever, ever in your life, even once, gotten angry at someone? Ah, oh, that was, that was good. Everyone else out there is going, hmm, let me think. You, some of you are a little too enthusiastic about how angry you get, but. <laughs> okay, so, so um, remember, you're in church. What do you say when you get angry with someone? I, I, oh, okay, good. He said, I'm sorry. Yeah. I forgive you. These kids are all better than me. Okay. My bad. My bad. <laughs> you get a little over-emotional. Drama. <laughs> Drama. Okay, so getting angry. You know what? You put your hands up because you go, yeah, we all get angry. Sometimes someone might say something and you go, Rrr. right? You get to that and they didn't like what they said and, 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 what do? And, and, and sometimes someone says something or does something to you and you get angry and you go like this. You get tense, right? Blood pressure goes up and your heart rate goes up and 
I don't have anger issues. <laughs> Jesus talks about this. Jesus says, you know, if someone does something and it causes you to be angry, if someone wrongs you, you get even? No, nope. no, nope. you don't get even. Do you just walk away? Well, sometimes that's the right thing to do at the moment. Just, just walk away because the situation's bad. But Jesus says, ultimately, you know what? You're supposed to treat them as a friend. Wow, that can be pretty hard with someone you don't like. Start treating them like your friend. That's hard for all of us to do. Yes, sir. Okay, so your arch rival said, you're weird, and you said, thanks, that's good. <laughs> I agree, I agree with that, because you know what? Everyone in this room is weird. <laughs> yep, I know that's what you're thinking. You're thinking, these people are weird people, but you know, Jesus said we're all weird together. Okay, let's put our hands together, let's pray. Dear Lord, Help us, Help us when we get angry. We get angry. And we get angry, we get angry a lot. Help us resolve, Help us resolve. differences with others, differences with others. So, that so that we can be friends. We pray through Jesus, through Jesus. Our, friend, our friend, our Lord, our Lord. and our Savior. our Savior. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, we've got stickers somewhere. Right here! Come on up and get stickers. we got Sunday school. Remember, fourth and fifth grade is uh, its own class over there. And if you need help, someone will uh, guide you. Ask Pastor Diane. She's over there this morning. And we'll see you next time. Of course, we started our fall season. And so uh, many things are happening now again that we uh, took a break for during the summer. Take a look at your uh, bulletin announcements for all of those things. And uh, I do need to speak again a little bit about... Uh, one of the great advantages we have in being a worldwide church. Uh, one of the great advantages is that we are everywhere in the world. So wherever they may be any kind of a natural disaster, our church is already there. So when you give a donation to Lutheran Disaster Relief, 100% of it goes to aid people in need. 0% is taken for administrative costs. 0% is taken for fundraising costs because it is part of the church's ministry that we already support. So when you gave money to uh, help those people in Houston after the hurricane, 100% is going to people in need. Now the way they determine that is they're, they're experts at doing this, the people that are involved in that and they know where government money will be going, and they know who are the types of people to fall through the cracks. And those are the people especially that, that are helped. Uh, so now we realize that we don't have to designate money for disaster relief for a particular hurricane, because there are multiple hurricanes. In fact, they're taking a number and lining up in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and some of them will hit and some of them may not. They may stay out in the ocean. So when you want to give, you can give just to Lutheran Disaster Relief. Don't have to designate the name of the hurricane or anything like that, and the money will go to help those people in need. So we encourage you to do that. You can do that by going to our church website, click on Donate Now, and you can say, you know, in the memo line there, you can say uh, Disaster, or you can put a check in the offering, say Disaster, and you can do that any time. We don't have to wait until a hurricane or an earthquake or whatever happens. You can give any time and it will be given. And we know now, given these two hurricanes, uh, the one who hit Houston, the one that hit Houston, and the one that is now hitting Florida, that it will be years of recovery efforts that will be needed. So uh, please, as you are motivated, give to Lutheran Disaster Relief, okay? So uh, we're going to continue now with our scripture readings.
God appointed Ezekiel as a sentinel for the house of Israel. Ezekiel must faithfully convey God's warning to his people. Remarkably, God, who is about to attack Jerusalem, gives a warning with the hope that repentance will make the attack unnecessary. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die. You do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity. But their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we will waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The next reading is Psalm 119, 33-40, responsibly. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, that I shall keep to the end. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Turn my eyes from beholding falsehood. Give me life in your way. Turn away the reproach that I dread, because your judgments are good. The obligation of Christians is to love one another and so fulfill the heart and goal of the law. Clothes make the person as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and live today in light of the future God has in store for us. The second reading is Romans 13, 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now, the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not as reveling and drunkenness not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. Please stand. Jesus said to the disciples, If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. 
If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Uh, receiving an invitation. We have our big invitation up there on the screen. You are invited. And when you receive an invitation, you are invited. It's, it's like, oh, good. I wonder what it's going to be. Good anticipation. Unless, of course, that invitation comes in the mail and says, you are invited to a dinner at this restaurant. Do you know they're going to ask you to buy something? Or if you get an email and you don't recognize who it's from and it says, you're invited, click on this. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. But an invitation would, oh boy, this is something to look forward to. Well, our, our son Paul, he's now 27 years old and he has Down syndrome and he loves to be invited to a birthday party. Uh, when we uh, lived in Texas, they were, Mark and Paul were little. And uh, Paul's birthday is May 25th. Mark's birthday is August 2nd. So like here, we said, oh, good. Swimming birthday parties, easy. Just invite kids over, swim, hot dog cake. Well, another thing that we would have is piñata. Yeah, I grew up 60 miles from Mexico in Tucson, and piñatas were all over the place. So you always had a piñata at a birthday party. So in Texas, yeah, some of the grocery stores would have a whole line of piñatas that you could buy, different shapes, characters, things like that. And so we introduced our kids to piñatas for birthdays, fill them with candy, hit it, break, open, whoosh, candy. The difference was in Texas, uh, piñatas weren't good enough just paper mache, they had to be steel reinforced. I mean, they made these things so sturdy that you could just beat it to death with a baseball bat, and the only thing it would do is break the candy inside. So I learned that I would have to take, take a knife and, and cut through a portion of the piñata so it was already part way through, and then they would soon break as well. So Paul, you can imagine, he just loves the fun of a birthday. And we would invite about 20 kids uh, to his birthday parties, a lot of them from church, some from school, some from his special ed class. Um, problem was, people didn't invite him back. I thought, he should get 20 invitations now for birthdays throughout the year. Nope. Um, the, pretty much the only people that ever invited him to a birthday were some refugees from Bosnia that my church resettled in our own neighborhood. We resettled them in an apartment close to our house. We would invite them over so their kids could go swimming in our pool often. They would invite our kids to events. Other people didn't. And so when I mentioned that, a parent said, well, maybe you should invite more handicapped kids, and then they would invite them. And I thought, first of all, that's really insensitive. And second of all, we do. We do invite kids from his school class that also have significant challenges. But here's how it works for some families and their children is that they're spending every day of the week taking their kid after school to doctor's appointments, to therapies, and all sorts of other things. And so they are exhausted. And an invitation to a party is, oh no, more work for me, because now I have to take my kid and help my kid and supervise my kid at, at a party. So that's the way it sometimes would work. But Paul loved invitations. So even now, that is, he's 27 years old, uh, his invitation is to all our family birthday parties, and he is now in charge of family birthdays, and he tells us what we get to do, and what food we're going to have, and what cake we get to have. And it always has some meaning based on the time of year, and who it is, and what it is. So for example, pa uh, Pastor Diane's birthday is October 18th. Remember that, buy her a gift. I'm making husband points right now. October 18th, so that's close to Halloween. So for her birthday cake, she gets, as Paul says, long bone cake, like a skeleton bone. 
So guess what I make her for her birthday cake? A long bone cake and with two pieces of cardboard and make this long bone. And, and Paul's happy and she's like, thanks, honey. Okay. I know I'm in trouble because she calls me honey instead of Pastor Dave. So, and for my birthday, we get to have a bowling birthday party because that's what Paul likes. Bowling birthdays now are Christmas. So invitations can be really good things. And it depends on what the invitation is for. Now you look at our invitation and it says, you are invited to a life of forgiveness. Oh, great. I have to forgive people. Well, that's no fun. That's not a great invitation. What does that mean anyway? When I'm doing uh, premarital counseling for couples about to get married, something that always comes up in the course of the counseling, the way it's designed, it always comes up, and it's the couple that always brings it up, is conflict and conflict resolution. And as we talk about this, I say, you know, here are 10 steps for conflict resolution. And you go, great, 10 steps. It sounds like something you read on the internet, you know, 10 steps for this. And everything's an individual screen, and you have to click on next, and then it has to reload all the ads, and it takes forever. After about three steps, you say, I'm not going to read any more of this. And you know what I do with my free time now? <laughs> Ten steps. Here's the first one. You don't have to do all ten. If you have conflict and you need to resolve that conflict, the first thing you do is you argue about it right away. And you say, yep, that's what we do. That's wrong. Because the first thing you do, you walk in and you say, I got a problem with you. What do you do? You go, whoa, defense. And there's no discussion that's going to take place from that point. So the first thing you do is you set a time and a place for a discussion when both of you can agree. Now this is good for couples, this is good for friends, this is good for coworkers. Set a time and a place where you can both come prepared to have a discussion. Number two is once you come together to have a discussion, you define the issue of your disagreement or your conflict. And sometimes in defining the issue of your disagreement, you realize that you're not mad at each other, you're really mad at your son because he always speaks up and throws off my kids' talk. But we know that. He's a great, Jeffrey's a great kid. And you realize, wait a minute, we're not mad at each other. We're mad at that thing out there. That changes the whole nature of conflict resolution. And if that doesn't work, then the third thing is the hardest one. That is, list all the ways that you yourself contribute to the problem. See, that's hard because I know all the ways you contribute to my problem but how do I contribute to this problem, this issue? And if you get to step number three, you're pretty well on the way of, wow, I, I guess I'm part of this problem too. Then, then there are more steps like list all the things you've tried in the past to fix this problem and don't do those because they obviously didn't work. So a life of forgiveness, we're supposed to do this all of the time. Well, St. Paul is writing to the Romans, and he's discussing, well, how we are to live in community, how we are to, to be God's people. And he says, well, you know the Ten Commandments, to follow the Ten Commandments, right? And, oh, boy, we're, we're big on the Ten Commandments, and, you know, oh, there's still conflict about where we can have the Ten Commandments and why, and sometimes we lose the point. So St. Paul says, you know the Ten Commandments, and he starts listing them. Did you notice anything about that when we read through it? The first commandment, you know, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. He didn't do that, he jumped to the middle. And he starts with, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And he starts with some of these big ones, big sins against other people. So, Years ago, in another state, in another church, I'm teaching, I'm teaching the catechism class, the middle school class. And we get to the part about the Ten Commandments. And Mark Luther wrote his catechism for instruction in the Christian faith. And he's teaching each of the Ten Commandments, what are they and what do they mean? And so we get to the one on you shall not commit adultery. Now these are middle school kids. And so I say, do you even know what adultery is? 
And one boy raises his hand and says, oh, I know what that is. My dad's done that. <laughs> I never asked that question ever again with middle school classes. He was embarrassed when he found out what it meant. Um, yeah, yeah, that was the case. But these are, you shall not murder. And you say, I'm good on that one. I haven't murdered anyone recently. Well, again, Martin Luther in his catechism, he takes each of these Ten Commandments that are a negative. You shall not do this. And he also turns it into a positive. So when it says, you shall not commit adultery, the positive side of that is, you shall do everything in your power to promote life and the benefit of other people. Wow, that does apply to me. I should make sure that I am working to make sure that you have a good life. I should work to make sure that people who are hit by a hurricane have the resources available in order for recovery and rebuilding. That's what you shall not murder means. This is getting harder and harder as we go along. So St. Paul says on, on the one hand, this is what you should do. And anyway, he concludes, let me sum up the Ten Commandments for you. Since we do debate Ten Commandments, there is conflict around it. He says, this is what the Ten Commandments can all be summed up as. Love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, we've heard Jesus say that also. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the next time someone's uh, in conflict about, can you display the Ten Commandments in a public place or government place? Well, go ahead, take them down and put up a plaque that says, love your neighbor as yourself. If we follow that, we will automatically keep all of the Ten Commandments in its fullness. Of course, then he says, now, the, the opposite you stay away from. So don't live your lives instead of loving one another. Don't live your life in reveling and drunkenness and debauchery and lici licentiousness. And again, we say, I'm good. I'm good on all those things. But wait a minute. What's this a description of? Reveling, drunkenness, debauchery, and licentiousness? Well, it's living in Las Vegas. <laughs> because you know you tell someone who's never been here before that you live in Las Vegas, and they, they think, <gasps> licentiousness. <laughs> and then you say, okay, Henderson. <laughs> That's it. That makes it all better. But then he lists two other things, too. Quarreling and jealousy. Ooh, boy. Yeah, he gets us again. Quarreling. Jesus says, okay, if you have a problem with someone, here are the steps you need to go through. Not quite ten, but he says, here are the steps that the law lays out that you should go through to keep good order in your church. If someone sins against you, the first thing you do is you get even. No, he doesn't say that. Our culture today says if someone wrongs you, you get them back tenfold, right? That's what's going on now. But Jesus says if someone wrongs you, go to that person, just the two of you, and tell them how wrong they are. You could translate it that way, but he says go to that person and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. I think the whole idea is talk with that person. Not accuse them, but talk with them. Then if that doesn't work, he says, try again with a witness there. Not someone who can help prosecute your case, but a witness who may help the two of you be able to work things through. Then if that doesn't work, He says, tell it to the church. Please don't do that here. Don't start saying, um, everybody, I got a problem with this person over here. They're wrong, and this is what they've done. And we, we don't want shaming, public shaming, and we don't want secretive gossip and backbiting, that kind of thing. But again, Jesus is talking about if a witness cannot help you in this process, maybe the whole church can help you with the healing of this. And then he comes to his conclusion, and I think the whole point is to say to you, all of these steps are so difficult that maybe you should start with my conclusion. If somebody has wronged you, treat them as a Gentile and a tax collector. 
And we think, okay, in terms of the Bible, Gentiles are people that are outside of God's chosen people. They're, they're the aliens. And tax collectors, well, who wants an invitation from a tax collector? You get an official notice from the IRS in the mail, you know what happens? Your heart just starts. Because I get one every year uh, because my son Paul, since we're his guardians, I have to give a report. And every year when I get it, I forget that it's that time of year and it's official government. And I go, <gasps> oh, treat one as a tax collector. And in Jesus' time, tax collectors were hated. But how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He treated them as friends. He accepted their invitations to go to their house even though that was against the righteous law. So Jesus is saying, you have a problem with someone, treat them as I would treat them. Someone to reach out to, constantly reaching out to, to make things better. Sometimes it's hard when we feel that there's, there's uh, not much we can do to, to reach out to other people. And, uh, you know, we've talked about the hurricanes, and, uh, you know, it, it's getting even more personal for some of us. Um, and so I'm going to ask you, um, we've been doing this at every service, if you have family or friends that live in the Houston area or Florida or any of the islands affected by the hurricane, we want you to tell us who they are because we're going to spend time in, in prayer and meditation about this because we are taking action by donating, but we also want to pray. So uh, put your hand up. Veronica will be on this side of the room. I'll be on this side of the room. Who has family or friends in the Florida, Houston regions? Okay. Uh, my sister, Cheryl, and her family. And I have a lot of friends. Okay. The people that we went on our honeymoon in 1978, the whole family. Bill and Rachel, Art and Pat. Tracy Titer. My brother Gary and his family. My best friend, Josephine Hill. Our friends, Soundarajan and David and others from the Tampa Christian Church. My 86-year-old uh, mother and my 94-year-old aunt in Florida. Many of my wife's uh, relatives live in Florida. Matt Murphy's dad, our drummer, dad lives in Florida, here in Orlando. Okay. Yeah, my cousins, Nancy, Frank, and Vernon in Florida. Two of my former students and their mom, who's my close friend. Okay, and Veronica, someone you also have? Yeah, um, my best friend on, on Texas. Mark Thompson lives in Lakewood, Florida. Everybody knows Florida. Uh, my friends Kayla and Rodney live in Houston, and a friend Jim Swinky lives in Houston. Okay. We got a lot of Cubans in Miami and in Cuba that are relatives and friends. Okay. Audience. Yeah, right here. My brother Kenny and my sister in law Debbie, and we have lots of friends in Florida. Cousin Isabel in Florida. Okay, so we're going to do something um, a little bit, a little bit different, and um, I'm going to ask you to spend some time in in um, prayer, in silent prayer and meditation as we uh, sing a song. I wrote this song a couple years ago, and it's based on Lamentations, a book in the Old Testament of the Bible, which is all about, um, Lord, I'm in trouble. Uh, I need your help, rescue me. And uh, so I wrote that song, and as we were rehearsing some music the other day, Veronica said, we need to sing that song about rescue, because so many people are in need of rescue. And I thought, that's right, uh, let's do that. And so I wrote another verse having to do with people who uh, are experiencing these hurricanes. 
So as we sing, there won't be any words on the screen. We ask you to spend the time during the music uh, to be praying for all of these people that you have heard uh, people expressing concern for. Rescue me. you always. Please stand up, walk around, greet each other with that peace of Christ.
has betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite our communion ministers to come forward. I need five people to assist. We invite everyone to share in this sacrament. We turn no one away.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Someone who has friends or family in Earth Games Way. You know who they are. 